Welcome back. As we continue our principles of Bible interpretation, we have talked about making observations of the text. This was step one. Then we talked about step two, interpreting the text based on those observations. And now we want to talk about step three, which is to apply the text. And of course, our application needs to be based on our interpretation, which is based on our observations. So hopefully we see that these all seamlessly move one into the other. In fact, they're not necessarily rigid steps. They're things that we're always doing. We're always observing the text, and we're always trying to summarize what is the author telling us. And of course, we're always doing it with an eye for well, what does God have for us today? In fact, I've noticed that in, in Bible studies and just in, in discussions with Christians, that often this third question of application, or sometimes it's phrased, what does the text mean for me, is often asked first. And we want to be very careful about doing this, because if we all approach the text asking, well, what does the text mean for me? It almost gives the impression that it has a different meaning for this Christian than this Christian than this Christian and this Christian. And I would argue that the meaning of the Bible is actually stable. There is only one text that we have in front of us that we're studying. It's the scriptures. And so this is a public text that we can all talk about the meaning and try to become as precise as possible as we look at details and big pictures and back down to details. However, when it comes to application, well, the applications are unlimited. We can take that meaning of that text and understand it as being applicable in many different situations, in many different cultures, and in many different aspects of our life. And as we go through different experiences in life, then sure enough, we are going to see new applications of the meaning of that text. And so I would encourage us not to ask that question up front, what does the text mean for me? Instead, let's talk about observing the text, interpreting the text, and then what is the meaning of this text? How does that have application for me? Maybe that would be a better way for us to phrase that. Before we begin with how-tos and application, it's important for us to just ask a, a, a fundamental question. Why do we even desire to apply the Bible? I mean, we read Shakespeare and we don't desire to apply Shakespeare. Or I mentioned Lord of the Rings in a previous week, and we don't desire to apply the Lord of the Rings to our life. Well, the reason that we do seek to do that with the scriptures is that the scriptures teaches us that God desires us to be obedient to his word. For example, Moses in Deuteronomy 27 through 30, he lays out part of the covenant code for Israel, and there are very clear consequences for disobedience, and there's very clear blessing that comes for obedience. And so these are laid down pretty much side by side so that the Israelites can see, wow, if I, if I live the way the Lord wants me to in the promised land, then it's going to bring a blessing and not cursing. However, if I'm disobedient, then there's going to be death and destruction, and ultimately it's going to end in exile. And unfortunately, we see that Israel's history plays out that way. In fact, as we look down through Israel's history, eventually we bump into King Josiah, king of Judah. And in 2 Kings 22 through 23, we find that uh, during his days, they were cleaning out the temple, and lo and behold, they discovered the law. Somehow it had gotten misplaced. It had been ignored for so long that it had been basically kind of shoved into some storage unit in the temple and then rediscovered. And as Josiah learns about the law, he realizes, wait a minute, what God commanded through Moses and what was applicable for them in their day and age is the same now. It's still applicable for me and our kingdom now in our day and age. And so he attempts to reform the nation of Judah based on the law. So what are we talking about here? Even though it was written hundreds of years before, Josiah recognizes that it's still applicable for him today. And I would argue that the same principle applies for us as you and I are reading the text. This is not an outdated book, even though the earliest parts have been written merely 2,000 years ago, and some of the later parts we can tack on multiple centuries from there. The Bible is still very relevant for our lives for today. However, doesn't the fact that people can read the Bible differently, doesn't that mean that, well, the applications can be very different? In other words, what if we come to the wrong interpretation? Can't that affect our application? And the answer is yes. If we misread the text, then we are going to also misapply the text. These just move one from the other. And so someone may say, well, we can read the Bible however we want to, so therefore doesn't that kind of destroy the principle of application? And let me give an illustration here that I think is helpful. When 
someone is driving down the road and they come to a stop sign, for example, a four-way stop, and they come to this symbol. It's an octagon painted red with the letters S-T-O-P, and it's an understood command, you stop. But let's say they interpret that sentence as, well, I'll slow down, I'll look both ways, and then I'll keep going through the stop sign. So imagine someone could do that. They could interpret that sentence that way. They have the freedom to do that. They can interpret it however they would like. However, also imagine that there's a police officer who is sitting kind of in a blind spot that they didn't see, and he pulls them over a mile or so down the road, and the driver says to the police officer, well, the sign to me meant that I just look both ways, and then I can slow down, and as long as it's safe, I can keep going through. And what's the police officer going to say? He's going to say, well, according to the authority of the state of Ohio, you need to actually come to a complete stop, and here's your ticket. So in other words, there's consequences for misinterpretation. And just because we have the freedom to read the text however we want, that doesn't circumvent the fact that we need to actually be asking what the author intended to communicate. See how all of these work full circle. The authority of the text comes from it being divinely inspired through the human author. And you and I labor to understand the meaning of the text. Why? So that we can properly apply it, so that we can properly be obedient uh, to God's word. Well, before we get into some principles for application, let me do one more thing. Let's talk about some errors that we need to avoid. Some of these I've actually already alluded to. The first error that we need to avoid is ignoring the literary context. So when we look at Scripture and we're wondering, how am I supposed to apply this? Sometimes we can ignore the literary text around, in other words, the context, and come up with applications that are actually very unbiblical, or maybe they're not unbiblical, but at least they're not based on that text. I remember several years ago listening to a, a missionary speaker who was challenging his audience, and he wanted to challenge them to, to take up the, the burden, the job of bringing the gospel overseas. And so he went to Exodus chapter 5, verse 1. And this is the narrative of Aaron and Moses going before Pharaoh. And what do they tell Pharaoh? They say, let my people go. And so the speaker said, let my people go. He started reading that verse, and then he stopped, and he said, go. God told them to go. G and O are the first two letters in God's name. Therefore, God wants us to go. Now, I hope we all see the problem with this. He left the text of Scripture and started focusing on the actual letters of the English word God and was trying to draw an application from that. You and I need to go and be missionaries because the first two letters of God's name are G and O. This is an obvious just departure from the text. Exodus 5.1 is not talking about anything related to that. In fact, it's talking about something very different. The author intended something different. Does that mean that the missionary message is wrong? No, it just means that that's probably not the best place to teach it from. So error number one, don't avoid the literary context. Uh, the second error that we can fall into is not recognizing our place in the biblical narrative and the place of the story that we're reading or the passage that we're reading. So, for example, Genesis to Revelation tells one overarching story of God's interaction with his creation and, of course, the fall of human beings where sin spreads into the world and then God's plan of redemption. And so we see that he chooses Israel and we see that he uses the church and we see that he's got an end plan in Revelation. However, there are things that God commanded for Israel to do that he has since, in the light of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, rescinded, and they're no longer applicable for us. Let me give an illustration. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Leviticus chapter 11 here. So we're smack dab in the middle of the law, the first five books of the Bible. And as you know, the Israelites had several unique characteristics that were supposed to be true of them. One of them was their diet, the foods they were allowed to eat and the foods they were not allowed to eat. And if you're looking at Leviticus 11, verse 29, Moses says, and these are unclean to you among the swarming things that swarm on the ground, the mole rat, the mouse, the great lizard of any kind, the gecko, the monitor lizard, the lizard, the sand lizard, and the chameleon. And then we could go on. In other words, what Moses is saying is that God doesn't want you to eat lizards. These are something that you're supposed to abstain from eating. And of course, the theology of the text and the why of the text, these are all great questions. Right now, I just want to acknowledge the fact that the Israelites were supposed to avoid eating lizards. 
However, when we flip to the book of Acts, chapter 4, we see something interesting happening. God is about to bring the apostles to the Gentiles. And so he has been working in the heart of a man named Cornelius, and Cornelius sends messengers to Peter, and Peter is visiting Simon the Tanner, and he happens to be up on his roof as he's waiting for lunch to be prepared. And you may remember the story that he falls into a trance, and Peter sees this sheet that comes down from heaven, and it's full of all of these unclean animals. And so the text tells us that this dropping of the sheet with animals happens three times, and this voice from heaven comes down and says, I want you to eat. And Peter says, no, Lord, there's nothing unclean that has ever touched my lips. And so in Acts, we see here that God is telling Peter to eat these unclean animals, and Peter is rightly saying, look, I follow the law, I don't eat that. And God's response is, don't call anything that God has made clean unclean. Now, this has broader implications for just diet. This is really talking about Cornelius and the Gentiles. However, if we're going to go back to Leviticus and try to apply that text, we need to understand that its place in the biblical story is very different from our place in the biblical story, having come after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And so, this is one of the tough spots of application, is actually being able to read a passage of Scripture in light of the greater context so that we make sure that we can apply it well to our lives. So two errors to avoid. Don't forget the immediate context, and don't forget the overall place of you and I and the narrative or text that we're reading in light of the big picture. Well, let's talk about a few uh, simple application principles that uh, we can utilize to move from interpretation to application. First, let the meaning of the passage determine the application. Let the meaning of the passage determine the application. It is no good for you and I to, to try to apply individual words or to try to apply individual sentences. This is where we run into trouble. What we really want to do is, since we've looked at meaning at the paragraph and discourse level, we want to look at this entire message and say, how can I apply this text, what's going on here? What is it that the author is wanting for me to do based on this? For example, if we only looked at Jonah chapter 1, and de never studied Jonah chapter 2, 3, and 4, and we asked ourselves, well, what are we supposed to apply from Jonah chapter 1? Inevitably, we would come up with some things, but probably many of them would actually be counter to the purposes of the author. Why? Well, because the story doesn't end at chapter 1. It actually goes to chapter 4. And the author has much more to teach us. And to be honest, it's really in the last chapter and a half that we really get to see the point, if you want to say it that way, of the entire story. Another principle that we can practice here is to determine the distance between our place in the biblical story and the, the place of the passage. So we've talked about this one already as an error to avoid. Now what we want to do is consciously think about, okay, the passage that I'm studying here, where does it take place in God's overarching narrative from Genesis to Revelation? In other words, is it after the cross and resurrection of Christ? Because if so, then that means it's going to be much more in the same aspect of Scripture that I'm in right now, and probably going to be more directly applicable. If, is it written before the cross? Well, this doesn't mean it doesn't have any application. It just means that we need to read it in light of the work of Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection to see if any of these principles have been rescinded or taken away. Another principle for application, attempt to be specific rather than general in your application. Attempt to be specific rather than just a general kind of shotgun approach to application. Once again, we can go back to an error to avoid in our summary of the paragraphs. It's pretty easy to say that all paragraphs mean love God and hate sin. However, that's not really specific to those individual paragraphs, and the same is true for application as well. It is true that God wants us to love him and to hate sin. However, could we be more specific? Like, what is this particular passage specifically having us apply here? What would it have us to do? And this moves into the next point of application. When considering application, ask yourself, how is this supposed to affect my behavior? How is it supposed to affect my thinking and my beliefs? And then how is it supposed to affect my emotions and my affections? 
In other words, let's not just limit application to behavior, what we're supposed to be doing and not doing. We really need to understand that the vast majority of Scripture is really corrective in our thinking and our beliefs. We come to the text with improper thinking, with improper beliefs, and we read the text and we allow it to renew our mind to truth. And of course, this affects our behavior and this affects our emotions. And this other part is very important as well. What do we love and what do we hate? How do we respond emotionally? Sometimes we might view our emotions, our affections as kind of off limits. They're very personal and we don't want them to be corrected. However, the text has much to say about what you should be loving and what you should be hating and how we're supposed to emotionally relate in God's world. So be specific rather than general. Try to focus on behavior and thinking beliefs and affections and emotions. The final principle here that I'd like to share with you is to back up from the passage that you've been studying and ask, what is it that the author is attempting to do? What is it that the author, he, we talked about authors writing to specific people for specific reasons in specific situations. So what are those specific reasons? What is the author trying to get his listeners or his readers to do? For example, the book of Jonah ends without knowing how Jonah responds. Could it be that the author is writing this book and he wants his audience to not only identify with Jonah, but to be corrected like Jonah. It's kind of like this uh, story where we don't really know how Jonah responds, and it's also an implicit challenge to us as well. Are we like Jonah? Should we be corrected like Jonah? Is there anything we can learn from God's correction of Jonah? And so by stepping back and saying, what is the author trying to do with this text? We can get at some of those application questions. Well, for our practice in this lesson, since we've done so much work in Jonah, it seems that we should stick with the book of Jonah. We've already done observation and interpretation, and now we can make application. So take the summaries of the paragraphs that you've done. Take the summaries of the discourses that you've worked on. Take the answers to the theological questions that you've come up with and formulate those into some points of application following the principles that we've laid out here. In fact, I would encourage you to focus on the last chapter and a half of the book of Jonah. It's here that we're not only going to see the rich theology of the author coming forward, but it's also where we're going to see our points of application based on the meaning of the text. Try to identify what the author is, is doing with this text. And next week, we'll pick up moving from observation, interpretation, application to talk about the genres of the Bible, particularly narrative genre.